Welcome to the uh, HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of uh, the XA Scale Computing Project of the United States Department, Department of Energy. I'm Osni Marquez from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, I'll be uh, the host for today's webinar, facilitating electronic structure calculations on GPU based XA Scale platforms. Uh, the webinar will be presented by Jean Luc Latubert. Jean-Luc is a research scientist in the computational sciences and the engineering division at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. His expertise is in high-performance computing, where he works at the intersection of material science and chemistry, numerical solvers, and computer science. Jean-Luc obtained his PhD from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, in Switzerland, in 1997. Uh, then he went to North Carolina State University as a postdoc, moved to the Center of Applied Scientific Computing at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, and in 2017 he joined Oak Ridge. Uh, we have issued uh, one, more than 100 tickets for today's webinar. Hopefully, a group of them show up today. All attendees have been muted upon entry. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also Google Doc. I'll paste the uh, address to that doc in the chat momentarily. Uh, we uh, ask Jean-Luc to add breaks during his presentation so he, uh, he can respond to the questions that come in. With that, I'll stop my sharing here. Jean-Luc, take over. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you, Osni. Uh, here. Okay, you should all be seeing uh, my screen Good. now, full screen. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Asni. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some work we've been doing uh, under the Exascale Computing Project. Uh, uh, we're part of the COPA project, which is a co-design center for particular applications led by Sue Mnievski at LANL. Uh, the team includes several uh, people from Los Alamos, where the, the software that we've been developing originated from, in particular Christian Negre, who is my uh, co-lead on this project. Uh, we also have Nick Bock, who is now external, but uh, one of the original member of the team at Los Alamos that developed this software. And we also have one collaborator at Livermore, uh, Daniel Jose Kufour. Um, I'm going to start by uh, giving some motivations uh, for our work, and then I'll dive more into details, technical details about our strategy to uh, target exascale hardware. Uh, we're using OpenMP offload and vendor libraries to optimize our performance. And I'll also discuss some solvers that we've been developing within this project. And I'll finish with some lesson learned during the past few years. Uh, the first motivation, so we are essentially uh, trying to help uh, the, the community, the electronic structure community, with some libraries uh, that uh, are common to most electronic structure code. And the common, uh, the common uh, bottleneck of many of this code is what we call, uh, you know, computing a single particle density matrix, which is as essentially uh, a projector onto the lowest uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of an Hamiltonian. So we like to provide, we're trying to provide a, a library to do that uh, efficiently, uh, that's portable across different uh, hardware, multi-core CPUs, GPUs, uh, and for different matrix formats, uh, dense and sparse and also distributed formats. Uh, by doing that, we give the user uh, the flexibility so that they can um, use different algorithm and, and explore algorithm, what works best for them, for their, uh, what they're interested in, and so for different hardware. And without having to worry about the underlying implementation. Now, um, one key, uh, um, a uh, bottleneck for this uh, code is how to uh, speed up the simulation and, and trying to to 
uh, enable larger simulation using GPUs. Uh, but typically, the time to solution is a limiting factor when you're interested in doing molecular dynamics. You want to solve the problem, the eigenvalue problem of the electronic structure many, many times at every step of a molecular dynamics until you, you, know, you reach a, a state where you have enough sampling of, of your system to, to get the result you are interested, interested in. And so the question is how long are you willing to wait until you get this result? So we're really trying to work in a strong scaling regime uh, and having a fast time to solution for every step. And it makes it tricky to, to use uh, the powers of GPU in this case, because uh, to, as, as probably many of you know uh, uh, already, uh, GPUs are very powerful, so they can do a lot of operations simultaneously. And to use them efficiently, you need to give them a lot of work. But as you go in the strong scaling limit, you may not have so much work for each GPU. And so uh, it, it's a balance to, to find how to, how to uh, uh, use efficiently GPUs. And so <clears throat> what we're really, really trying to do, uh, let me grab a pointer, is, is really lower the time to solution uh, for problem uh, larger than what we can do now. And uh, what I'm showing here also is the, the complexity of typical solvers. If you take a dense direct diagonalization that's often used in electronic structure code, the scaling goes like the n cube, like the, the cube of the number of electrons in the simulation. There are methods that scale like the uh, linearly with the number of electrons in the system, but you know th there is some overhead associated with it, and it takes um, a relatively large system to get advantage of that. And so we are trying to um, lower the cost of this simulation, both order n and order n cube, to make uh, the simulation feasible for larger systems uh, using GPUs accelerators. So, so it, it's hard to, uh, as I said, you know, a GPU is very powerful and can do a lot of work. Now, if you want to try to use several GPUs simultaneously to speed up this calculation, it's even a harder problem because you need each GPU to have enough work and to even amortize the communication between uh, their work. So you end up with problems that may be too large. Uh, you know, if your problem is sufficiently large to fully utilize a GPU, your problem may be too large to do, to do molecular dynamics and your time to solution may be too long uh, to enable this MD. So this is a difficult task to address. So uh, within the Exascale Computing Project, uh, we've been trying to help one particular application, uh, which is the, the Exalt project, also out of Los Alamos, uh, running their, their atomistic simulation with quantum uh, forces or quantum um, molecular dynamics. And the way uh, this is used is you essentially uh, launch multiple independent replicas of the system that run MD molecular dynamics with different conditions, different initial conditions or different temperature or different parameters. And on each GPU, you're going to use one, run one single molecular dynamics, one single instance of a molecular dynamics. And uh, the way it's done in this context is by having the, the ensemble type simulation code pass splice calling lamps, the molecular dynamics code to run the MD. Then underneath is going to call uh, LATTE, which is a tight binding code developed at Los Alamos to calculate the atomic forces at the quantum level. And underneath that, that's where uh, our projects comes in. Uh, we're trying to uh, accelerate these codes by uh, developing the tools that this code can use to speed up this calculation. So this include uh, uh, BML, which is a basic matrix library that implements the, the basic operations we need on matrices, and progress, which implements solvers to calculate this density matrix. So <clears throat> let me dive a little bit more into what 
problem exactly we're trying to solve. So when I sort of say we're trying to solve the density matrix, essentially um, we need to solve a dense eigenvalue solver typically. So you start from an Hamiltonian that comes from the physical problem. You could, the straightforward way of solving this problem would be to calculate all the eigenvalues and eigenvector of this problem for this Hamiltonian. From these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you can calculate a projector or a matrix, the density matrix P, which can be computed uh, with uh, the matrix V made, made of the eigenvectors and F, which is just a diagonal matrix where the, the diagonal elements are given by this Fermi Dirac function, basically a function that takes values one for the lowest eigenvalues and zero for the highest eigenvalues. So this is a, this matrix P is symmetric and with eigen uh, symmetric with eigenvalues between zero and one. In the special case where the eigenvalues you are interested in that correspond to the occupied electron uh, electronic wave function and the the rest of the spectrum you are you, you don't really care about, you um, if you have this gap, you this is simply a projector onto the lowest eigenstates. Now, one uh, issue uh, that comes up when you start using GPUs is that not every algorithm works well there. And I'm trying to illustrate this point here by comparing what is the cost of solving a dense eigenvalue problem, which with a standard uh, solver, such as the, the LAPAC uh, DSYEVD, which is a divide and conquer um, algorithm for solving a dense, eigen, dense eigenvalue problem and comparing that to the the, the cost of matrix multiplying one matrix with another one so if you do that on a cpu your cost for one diagonalization compared to one single matrix matrix multiplication is you know less than 10 which is okay you know it's a little bit more complicated algorithm and if you, even though these two algorithms should use a similar number of flops, the ratio is still uh, below 10 and reasonable. When you go on a GPU, the story is different. The ratio, that is the time to solution for solving one dense eigenvalue problem compared to one single matrix matrix multiplication goes up to as much as a thousand for matrices that are like say, sized 1000 by 1000. So doing dense diagonalization on a GPU is not such a great um, use of a GPU if you want. It doesn't use the performance of a GPU so well. So it motivates some of the algorithmic development we've been doing. So this is like uh, two um, specific algorithms we've been uh, focusing on to solve these problems. Um, one for system with the band gap and one for general uh, metallic systems. And these are based on, there are two, example of algorithm based on matrix matrix multiplications only. So the first one, you, you build an initial guess, knowing your Hamiltonian, you can do shift and scale this Hamiltonian to give you initial guess. And then you can do a very simple iteration, either taking the square or two, two times the matrix minus the square, depending on the value of the trace. And iterate this for about 15 iterations until you converge to a very good solution. Uh, if you have a metallic system where you don't have a gap between the eigenvalues you're interested in and the rest of the spectrum, but you have a continuous, um, uh, you have basically a, um, a very dense uh, spectrum of eigenvalues near this uh, um, Fermi level, uh, you can uh, do another algorithm, which is basically uh, trying to represent this function as a Chebyshev polynomial. So, I mean, this is. You can imagine doing the Chebyshev polynomial on single element. You can do the same on matrices. Uh, you could, for example, um, transform your matrix into a diagonal matrix, apply uh, the Chebyshev polynomial to the diagonal element and then transform back. Or, But you can also do it directly to the matrix. These are actually ideas that were introduced uh, in the 90s and early 2000s with the idea of reducing the cost of the electronic structure calculation for a very large system. 
going from an n cube scaling to an order n scaling. And the idea behind that was that if you if you rely simply on, uh, on matrix matrix multiplication, when you take one sparse matrix, multiply it by another sparse, this is an order n operation. And if you can truncate your result or keep keep your matrix uh, sparse enough during the algorithm, your all uh, your overall solver uh, takes order n of operations. Now this is a, this was the original motivation, but what we we find out now is that on GPUs, just because the matrix multiplication is so much more efficient than a dense diagonalization, this this type of algorithm is also efficient on GPU. And so this is an ex an illustration on the right, where you can see, for example, for a matrix of a thousand by a thousand, the uh, this uh, SP two algorithm that I showed on the previous slide becomes much faster than a dense diagonalization, much faster than what we. Uh, this is a measurement we did on uh, Nvidia via one hundred comparing to the Q solver to a simple SP two uh, iteration. And you can see the big gain you can get from using uh, um, matrix matrix uh, uh, matrix multiplication based algorithm. Okay, now I'm going to uh, dig deeper into the software we've been developing, and then maybe it's time for for questions if there are any. Uh, no, not at this point. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So the two libraries that we've been developing. Uh, under the, the umbrella of the Exascale computing project are called BML and Progress. BML stands for Basic Matrix Library, and you can find it on GitHub, uh, open source. Um, this is basically it implements the basic linear algebra operation that are used in different solvers, from calling a dense diagonalization to matrix multiplication or inversion. Uh, Progress on the other end is one level above and between this BML and the application code. And that's where we implement the solver, such as these SP2 solver or the Chebyshev that I described earlier. This is also an open source code that you can find on GitHub. Now, um, when it comes to offloading uh, our, the code to GPU, one thing we looked in, into early on was to use OpenMP. Uh, if you're not familiar op with OpenMP, OpenMP is essentially a way of implementing a multi-threading in your code with simply adding uh, pragmas in your code. Um, I'm showing in the example on the right, um, the, all the black fonts have been used for the, what you would do on a CPU. And in red, this is the additional uh, things you would do on a GPU to offload. So it includes uh, mapping your data from the CPU to the GPU and mapping the result back to the CPU. So this is, and this is available as uh, starting with OpenMP 4.5. And this is the, the advantage of this approach of using OpenMP is that it's supported by many compilers. It doesn't need, you don't need to link with the, another library. And uh, in principle, it should work on uh, any hardware. Now, in practice, we found some uh, uh, that OpenMP was not sufficient for us to achieve the performance we wanted. So in particular, um, for some critical kernels, such as doing a sparse matrix matrix multiplication, uh, simply adding pragmas like this was not giving us a, a good performance at all. And we, and as, as we did not expect to, to see uh, performance change significantly in the near future, uh, what we decided to go for was a, a, a hybrid strategy. Well, basically we use OpenMP offload for things such as uh, memory allocations, Data, data movement between CPU and GPUs, and also non-critical uh, uh, kernels that don't take much time. And on the other hand, to use uh, vendor-specific uh, libraries to do the very the heavy lifting 
of the, the, the important kernels, such as a sparse sparse matrix multiplication. So this is a summary of our general strategy. So we try to leverage libraries as much as we can, both on the CPU and on the GPU. So on the CPU, we just use the standard BLAST, LAPAC, and SCALAPAC. While on the GPU, we try to rely on Magma as much as possible since it's portable, you know, as well as OpenMP 4.5, but also other libraries that are vendor specific. Some of the challenges with this approach is that as we're trying to support various GPUs from NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel, uh, you know, it's a lot of, uh, we have to do, deal with various uh, vendor libraries and interfaces. Indeed, there's, to our knowledge, there's no sparse, sparse matrix multiplication in any library that would give us the performance we want and it's portable across all the platforms we're interested in. So the current strategy is to use um, the, the best available libraries on the platform we have been working with, such as Kusparas and Kusolvers and others. And basically what we're doing is uh, doing the work so that others don't need to do it. We basically provide a, a uniform interface for all these libraries uh, through our library. Uh, one of the challenges too is, is to make OpenMP offload work with these libraries uh, in, a, in an environment where the software stack uh, may change, comparable version change, and suddenly something is not compatible anymore, and so on. And this is a summary of our software stack, if you want. So if you have a, um, an electronic structure package on top of it, you would call uh, our progress library to solve uh, your, your problem. And then underneath, you would rely on BML to do the operations. And I'm trying to highlight with the yellow star to show what was new, uh, was introduced recently under the Exascale Computing Project funding. It includes uh, adding new formats, uh, including a distributed format, and also interfacing with various libraries, uh, distributed libraries, GPU libraries, GPU solvers, and so on. Now the, the matrix formats that we are working with, we have actually four formats that we're really supporting, one dense and three sparse. But for the GPU offload, we've been focusing on two, on the dense format and one sparse format, which is called LPAC. LPAC, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically, uh, it's a format where you decide upfront the maximum number of non-zero values you're going to allow for each row. So if you have a sparse matrix like this one, you're going to say, I'm going to have a maximum of five non-zero elements per row. And you you uh, store your, your, so you can pre-allocate your whole a big a block of memory and uh, store your non-zero values there. Um, and as well as, uh, the other information needed to retrieve this data. It has the advantage compared to a standard CSR that you, you pre-allocate uh, that block of memory in continuous memory. In terms of uh, data types that we're supporting uh, in the code, um, so we're supporting uh, single and double precision as well as complex. Um, single and double complex, which is important for uh, many uh, calculations, electric structure for periodic systems, in particular, what's so-called K-points calculation that introduce some uh, complex phase. And our strategy, it's a C code. So we don't have templates uh, available for us. So basically we're working with macros and the functions that depends on the specific data types are recompiled um, with different um, values for these macros. The Fortran interface is a, a very important feature for our customers, if you want, for the user codes uh, that are often uh, written in Fortran. So 
the way we offer this option is with uh, wrappers functions around the all the, fun the functions that need uh, are needed uh, for this application code or actually for progress uh, the progress library uh, this is not automatic this is not done uh, uh, using any fancy tool but uh, the, the low the overhead is pretty low in code writing as our interface is rather uh, stable and not too many functionality get uh, added uh, and so this is the approach in terms of uh, testing and continuous integration we have a pretty extensive series of tests that runs over all the different data types and matrix formats this is very convenient also for developers uh, just as we uh, add um, options and fix things in the code um, make sure that everything remains um, in place in terms of continuous integration every pull request is tested on cpu using the github resources for gpu we use the the resource offered by the olcf um, using ascent to test the uh the gpu implementation uh this is currently done only for the dense format using the the magma implementation uh we also use github for um, issues tracking our own issues and as well as users issues okay now i'm going to go deeper into uh floating to gpu uh strategies uh, it's another Good time to uh, uh, see if there are questions. Yes, uh, so look, actually, there. Uh, going back some slides, you mentioned there were uh, you had some uh, uh, problems with Open OpenMP, uh, and uh, what were them those and uh, the compiler you used? And uh, um, so the compiler we use is typically the GNU compilers. Uh, we've also used the Excel compiler on IBM. Um, and uh, this is a, the Cray compiler on AMD. Uh, the, the, the main issues have been uh, performance for some kernels, uh, but also uh, making sure it's, um, it, it's compatible with the software stack, uh, the libraries and so on, everything is compatible. But the, in terms of the, the language, the language, in terms of the language, which we actually using probably a very small subset of uh, the uh, uh, capabilities of OpenMP. So we've not had any issues of, of, uh, of in terms of uh, functionalities that are not well supported or things like that. So it was, so mostly it was mostly compiler issues. Basically the compiler didn't generate um, the, the code as efficiently as you would like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I That's will have a performance uh, plot later on. Later on, showing you how it is uh, the performance wave on AMD. Okay, and then and then the the uh, 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 Oh, sorry, uh, Gabriel. It's better that if we so if we continue and then we delay the questions. Wait until then. Thank you. Okay, should I continue? Jean Luc, please. Yes. Yeah, okay. I will actually address some of these questions in the sure, sure, yes, we'll get there. Gabriel, please bear with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, here's a summary of our offload loading strategy. So, um, when we talk about dense format, this dense matrices on NVIDIA and AMD, we rely essentially on Magma, uh, except for some vendor libraries for that are when they are performing much better than the magma and one example is a Q solver uh, on nvidia that's uh, um, performing the magma uh, significantly uh, for intel uh, dance and as well as a sparse formats on all the machines we're using uh, openmp offload for memory allocation data transfer and a few other operations and use vendor libraries for performance critical kernels the way we use OpenMP, uh, as I mentioned in the questions, uh, it's we don't use very uh, advanced feature. We use the basic, essentially the basic uh, features uh, offered for offloading. 
Um, one thing we're doing uh, specifically is, so our, our matrices are objects, if you want to see struct. And what we do is we don't offload the whole struct, but we offload just the pointers to the data. And this is, uh, you know, three lines of code that show, show you uh, briefly what we do, uh, basically allocating the data on the GPU and uh, copying data from uh, the CPU to G GPU. So we, we have a full control of the data movement between CPU and GPU. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're using um, the LPAC format within our libraries, and it's not um, uh, the same format used by all the vendors. Typically, vendors use a CSR, a true CSR with the data each row uh, is uh, stored right after the previous one. And so we end up using um, function and functions to convert from one data format to another. Um, one thing we found out too is that some libraries required the columns to be ordered in the right way. We also found issues with uh, workspace required that was so large that we could not really, uh, it was not really useful for us uh, for the course parts, for example, on NVIDIA. Uh, we expect it to be better with the next release. Um, also, there are some requirements, for example, if you do the matrix multiplication, the uh, a, a, B plus beta C, uh, the, the sparsity pattern of A, B, and C are expected to be the same one. So these are kind of the issues that we've been facing when trying to use these libraries. Uh, so uh, let me now uh, see how we kind of some results and how we did the testing. The first thing is um, to be able to test systematically for a range of matrix sizes. What we did is we developed our own uh, model Hamiltonian to test performance. Um, th there's basically no uh, good benchmark in the field, and we wanted to avoid storing very large matrices. So what we are doing is basically uh, we're using this model, the tight binding mo uh, Hamiltonian model, which is uh, widely used in the community, uh, with a simple parameterization that allows us to, to mimic uh, different system, metallic system, uh, system corresponding to biomolecules or semiconductors by tuning a, a few parameters. And we can use that to evaluate performance on, on these uh, machines. And this is the result we obtained recently on Crusher at OLCF. So, and it shows uh, the, some of, it illustrates some of the point I was making earlier. So let's look first at the dark blue. This is a performance, so time to solution in milliseconds as a function of the matrix size. And you see the this is a performance on CPU using eight threads. Now, the performance using simple, simply OpenMP, adding simply OpenMP pragmas around our own code give us a, a, a actually a quite a slowdown compared to the CPU performance on AMD. So as you can see here, it's really, it does, you know, it's performed poor, very poorly. So then what we did is, as I was explaining, we started switching the, the, the critical kernels with vendor libraries, such as Rocksparse. And so this is the light, light blue is the initial um, implementation. We started using Rocksparse and obviously it, it showed up some, it, it, uh, yeah, it showed some other bottlenecks that where some of them were, you know, implementation that had been a bit, uh, you know, not very careful and things that we didn't think about. Or, and basically after cleaning up the code, we get now a much better performance uh, on GPU using Rocksparse. Okay, I can pause for another question or two here. Yeah, there is. A, we'll get back to the OpenMP discussion later. But there is one here. Can you comment on possible use of features in SQL and any potential impacts on performance? We have not been looking into SQL at all uh, for now. Um, so yeah, I have no experience with that. Okay. okay. Uh, please continue. Yeah. So. Um, now let me talk about another algorithm, uh, one of the algorithms we've been uh, 
we're implement, implementing in progress, which is the Chebyshev solver I mentioned earlier, uh, which is specifically for metallic systems. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, for den for metallic systems, the dense um, the density matrix we're trying to compute is essentially the inverse of this matrix here, with the uh, um, identity plus exponential of that involves the Hamiltonian uh, shifted Hamiltonian. And basically, this this is the the eigenvalues of that uh, matrix that we should find. And so basically, we're trying to approximate that function with the Chebyshev polynomial. Uh, one problem is we, if we try to do that uh, directly, is it, it can involve uh, over 100 terms. And so it becomes computationally costly. Uh, you may remember I showed you in one of the first few slides that doing a dense diagonalization can be 100 times or even more costly than a matrix multiplication. But if you need over, you know, more than, you know, a few hundred mat matrix multiplication, you lose what you um, you could expect to gain from using simpler algorithms. So one thing, a uh, trick that we've been using to implement that more efficiently is an old idea by Patterson and Stockmeyer proposed in the 70s, which is basically to rewrite. I don't expect you to, to read all this uh, on the right. Uh, just in all the terms, but basically I'm trying to illustrate if you have a polynomial of order Km minus one, that this would be the, the way you would write it. You can group terms in a, in a smarter way so that you reduce the number of uh, matrix multiplication. Um, so if X is a matrix here, um, so instead of having uh, Km uh, minus one matrix multiplication, you have only uh, over uh, you know the order two times the square root of that number for multiplication. So you know if your uh, polynomial order was order of hundred, you end up with only twenty matrix multiplication and becomes quite competitive with the diagonalization. So and this idea was adap adapted for the adapted to the Chebyshev um, uh, scheme, the Chebyshev polynomial for density metric calculation. Uh, by the by head uh, Ed Gordon's group in, uh, in Berkeley in 2004. Now, how does it perform in practice? This is a test we did on NVIDIA V100, so on, on Summit at OLCF. Um, we are comparing what speed up we get from using such an algorithm compared to using a dense algorithm uh, with the coup solver from the NVIDIA library. And so we're showing here the speed up. And so as you can see, if your matrices are relatively small and your um, Chebyshev expansion order is not too too long, uh, you have a very substantial, um, you know, a very good speed up. Um, only if your matrices are it becomes pretty large. Here is for the black dots are for matrices four thousand by four thousand. And your um, expansion and the, the the order of your polynomial expansion extension goes beyond five hundred. You start being uh, less competitive. So it shows the potential of this type of algorithm on GPUs, in particular for matrices that are not super large. In addition to that, um, even if you do just matrix multiplication. If your matrices are less than 4,000 by 4,000, or you don't even fill up your, your GPU uh, with one single operation, a single matrix multiplication. So you could do several concurrently using uh, GPU streams. And so that's one thing we we are uh, exploring too. And uh, we're looking at the speed up. So for example, if you have a, if you think about a simple uh, polynomial, of matrices, and you want to calculate all the terms up to uh, to the power eight. So this is a kind of sequence you can do. And when you have the power of three and four and beyond, you have several operation, several uh, calculation you can do sim simultaneously. And so you can translate that into GPU streams and have an ex that additional speed up. And so here, depending 
the upper right uh, figure here shows you the the additional speed up you get from using streams as a function of again the number the expansion terms to so the chelly beach of polynomial order and for different uh, matrix sizes and again um, well if your matrix size become large you don't gain so much because one single matrix multiplication you know, is is good enough to uh, keep the gpu very busy but if your matrices are not that big you have a in a, a pretty good uh, speed up from using this technique Okay, I can pause for question again, if there are any. Let me see here. Yeah, it's still related to uh, OpenMP. If you compared yeah. OpenMP of load performance across compilers. We did not hear for this project, no. Um, I mean, the... And the 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 main one the main uh, our main kernel where we were worried about performance so this is a sparse matrix matrix multiplication was performing so poorly and we didn't expect a different compiler to do better this is something we could re revisit but um, the issues that we were facing there we didn't expect it to be specific to the com to a compiler more to the the kind of granularity that OpenMP allows us to 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 work with. And uh, I think uh, relates to, I think to this. Have you tried the NVIDIA compiler for OpenMP on NVIDIA GPUs? Mm, I don't think we've tried that one. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then continue, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, now kind of uh, the last technical part. Uh, uh, I want to take a you know a few minutes to talk about distributed computation. So even though I you know I motivated the problem, we say we want very fast time to solution for problems that are not super big, so we can do molecular dynamics. We're also interested in somewhat bigger problems, and the question is how can you uh, distribute across multi GPUs uh, these larger problems. So there are two approaches that we've been looking at. One essentially is a uh, divide and conquer approach where you try to divide your matrix into some matrices, overlapping submatrices, mm -hmm. and compute them you know, simultaneously and then um, putting the result back together in a smart way. Uh, what we've implemented is actually uh, an algorithm that was proposed by uh, Anders Niklasson and collaborators at Los Alamos a few years ago. Um, and basically, the main difference compared to the typical approach is that it's the the partitioning, the the way the the the, the fragments are put together is by using <coughs> the matrix elements. And so basically a graph based approach where we look at the strengths of matrix elements between uh, different nodes. And so this way, it provides an automatic way of partitioning a matrix into some matrices. And also it gives an order and solver. So basically for a given uh, partition sizes, you can grow your problem and have a cost that goes only linearly with the size of the problem. And this is uh, some of the results we obtained for this, uh, this approach, basically, uh, what it shows that if you, your threshold value for the cutoff uh, goes up, uh, basically you're truncating uh, more, you, you lose, uh, uh, your error goes up to on the other end. If you, you know, with tight tolerance, you can uh, have a, a pretty good um, accuracy. The other approach is we try to leverage what we did for uh, non-distributed uh, matrix operations. So what we've introduced is a, a distributed uh, format. Uh, we call distributed 2D, which is basically, um, essentially it's a wrapper around our uh, you know, shared memory uh, matrices. And so what, what we end up having is, uh, let's say this is a two by two 
domain decomposition uh, matrix decomposition on four processors each processor owns a square matrix which is um, one of the other formats we're supporting on shared memory and so this is a very non-intrusive implementation a lot of the functionalities are essentially wrapper around the 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 shared memory code that we've been working on and optimizing uh, some operation will be more uh, demanding uh, and some are we're not even uh, addressing some are beyond scope we're not trying to rewrite a new dense distributed solver for that for example we use scale pack on cpu and elpa on gpu but again the the library is providing a, a unified interface for all that and some operation that uh, we're implementing is uh, you know again we're interested in fast fast matrix matrix multiplication so what we're using currently for this format is the the canons algorithm uh, to to implement this matrix multiplication and this is a last break you can take questions before I address the last part there were some comments here and I think we'll have more questions but let, let's continue and then at the end we'll address okay. those yeah so one well, the last point I want to make is that so what I've talked about so far is so you have a dense Hamiltonian or you have an Hamiltonian and you try to solve the density matrix as fast as you can on using GPUs now there's a whole category of codes uh the mo main most well known is the plane wave code where it's not that simple you actually it's a, it's a different use case you have a actually is a huge super sparse matrix and you don't solve it directly what you do you introduce an auxiliary subspace uh, that you try to improve iteratively and in that subspace you are going to calculate uh, Hamiltonians and density matrices so this is a kind of the way it looks like uh, it could you know the solution is typically a tall and skinny matrix the number of columns is a number of electronic wave functions you're computing and the number of rows is the number of degrees of freedom for each wave function this number of degrees of freedom could be the number of of um, plane, of um, Fourier coefficients in a plane wave decomposition uh, discretization or the number of mesh points in the finite difference approach and the ratio between this m and n is very large typically now as I said you typically don't solve this problem directly in this large uh, space that could be a mesh of maybe 128 cube or more what you do you you find uh, a trial subspace in which you're going that you're going to improve over time so, so this is a tall um, a tall and skinny matrix that on and you're going to calculate project that whole problem onto a much smaller subspace and what you end up with is essentially the same uh, problem we've been sol trying to solve with progress and bml which is basically now calculating the single particle density matrix within that subspace uh, solving a, a linear algebra problem within that subspace a much smaller problem now now if you look at it from a point of view of of uh, data distribution on a computer and our main operations uh, one thing we did uh, a few years ago was try to to evaluate this uh, um, this strategy um, uh, using a proxy app which is basically uh, which is essentially a, a, an orthogonalization which we call a loved in orthogonalization that essentially what you need you know if you have two tall and skinny matrix you have to take the the product between all the the column of these matrices that give you the gram matrix S you need to you know then you need to uh, accumulate these matrices across MPI task take the square root inverse of that matrix and then apply it to a tall and skinny matrix and now the bottleneck is this uh, as I'll show you in the next slide the bottleneck is this calculation which is basically the same as uh, when you saw uh, and again um, is basically solving an eigenvalue problem as is in the whole problem so this is a good proxy app that shows that utilizes the same 
operations that rely on the same uh, set of uh, operations. And then what we showed is in practice, so if you have a very tall and scaly matrix and you can distribute, uh, suppose you have as many processors as you want, as many GPUs as you want, and you try to strong scale your problem, you end up showing that this, this square then the dense diagonalization in this case is a bottleneck more than the, the communications. We show that on NVIDIA, the communications using the, the Nickel library is actually an order of magnitude faster than this dense diagonalization, even using the type of iterative schemes I've been showing, uh, presenting earlier in this talk. So again, this is really the, the one of the bottleneck for for electronic structure calculation uh, on these uh, on these supercomputers with GPUs accelerators. So as you should see here, goes up to ninety six GPUs, ninety six MPI tasks, uh, and uh, yeah, everything else scales very well except for that that becomes a bottleneck. Now let me finish with one slide with some lesson, less, lesson learned. Um, basically what, you know, so it's been an experience for many people, I believe, but using GPUs efficiently is a, is a lot of work. Um, as I showed, you know, using a MPDP alone is not always sufficient to get a good performance. And maybe, you know, have another experience with another code with, we finally got enough performance, but it was really a lot of work. Uh, relying on vendor libraries can help, uh, but this is not easy either. Uh, every every library has its own interface, own requirements. Uh, software stacks can be issue, an issue, uh, you know, between compilers and and compatibilities and so on. So, yeah, um, building a software stack that supports uh, all these third-party libraries and multiple GPUs is a challenge, and um, even if we are towards the end of the the ECP um, funding round, uh, there's still a lot of challenges on this uh, exascale platform. And finally, one thing that I hope I, I illustrate with this talk is that uh, sometimes there are algorithms that are more G GPU friendly than others and can become com more competitive on GPUs than they would be on CPUs. And that can be the, the one we should use on GPUs. And this is the end of my talk, and I would like to thank you everyone for your attention. And I'll take uh, questions if there are any left. Yes, thank you, Jean-Luc. There is one here by Victor Yu. Could you comment on the scalability of your distributed matrix multiply on GPUs? Uh, it's not fully optimized at this point uh, because we don't have the, uh, we have not uh, implemented the GPU where um, communications yet. So I believe this is the bottleneck now and that's need to be done. Yeah. Again, um, we, we are interested in, in large scale, uh, and distributed, uh, computation, but, uh, it's kind of a, took a backseat, uh, with priorities focusing on the single GPU, uh, fast time to solution. And Jean-Luc, in your opinion, Al Alfred has a question, interesting question. What is the main obstacle for, uh, to using GPU efficiently? What is the main, sorry? Obstacle. Obstacle? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really depends on your application. Uh, it, it, I mean, can vary. I mean, for us, for example, for the diagonalization, I think I don't know if if you use a if you try to do a dense diagonalization uh, uh, with a typical algorithm. I, I think, for example, we saw that Nvidia didn't had done a very good job for their dense eigensolver. But even with that, you know, performance is not that great. I mean, I don't and I don't expect anybody to be able to do much better. Maybe a different, totally different algorithm would work. For us, we we can use totally different algorithm because we're interested in a specific result, right? We're interested in this uh, projector, if you want. 
we were not interested in the uh, individual eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So that's a way we can get around. But if your algorithm, I mean, so one algorithm is one thing. Um, the other thing is what right, we're trying to have portability. So uh, we don't want to rewrite every every kernel for every hardware. We don't want to write, you know, in every language. And so relying on OpenMP was a good trade-off for us, but doesn't perform well everywhere. So as I showed, so yeah, it really depends on your application uh, and algorithm. Gabriel, would you like to uh, unmute and then ask directly to uh, Jean-Luc? Um, sure, sure. I, I, I only have a comment now. I, I applaud you for using the libraries. I find that vendors uh, provided libraries always uh, give the best performance. And um, if, but then, then you are stuck with the, with the problem that maybe they are not available on all platforms, right? So, um, who knows what else comes up in, in hardware and then maybe they don't have a plus implementation, but most likely they will. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and, and then I think, but because I'm working on the OpenMP committee also, so I'm, I'm a defender. <laughs> And and I'm always collecting, you know, missing features from people if they can report some. You know, we really would want to do this and that, but OpenMP didn't allow that. But it looks like for for you, it's mostly comp compiler issues. And I think um, replacing this whole this whole um, linear um, algebra operation with the call to the vendor library. The vendor will most likely have restructured this like linear al uh, algebra um, algorithm for you to make it more efficient, to make it perform more efficiently on the GPU. So, um, you know, and, and if you would have rewritten it and see, then maybe you could have used the OpenMP directives more efficiently. But just my, my comment. Well, I've heard. I've about OpenMP, we actually have a, um, an expert, um, uh, Jamal, who's on a team who has been doing some of that work. And uh, um, I think his conclusion is from knowing the, the standard and implementations of various compilers that, you know, for the, for the, for the moment, we, had, you know, we could not get the performance we, we expect with OpenMP. Um, in terms of libraries, one thing I would like to add, you know, so as I've shown, you know, one of the main kernel we're interested in is doing a sparse times sparse matrix multiplication. And interestingly, I mean, the sparse times dense is very well used and optimized by many vendors, right? You do a sparse matrix times a, a vector or, a, uh, you know, several vectors in a tall and skinny matrix. And this is used for by many by many people, many projects in you know, in different contexts. But the sparse times sparse is not as used. And so, for example, I showed you some of the issues we have on on Nvidia, that you know the, the workspace is super large and, and issues like that. And I mean, so just because it so it's great when we can rely on on libraries. And the more used they are by the community, the better they're going to be. And when we get into the area where these libraries are not as used by so many, sometimes they are only lightly tested and may not perform as as well as you expect. And uh, uh, so there are, I mean, obviously we are um, working with vendors and and uh, um, pushing uh, for better solutions. But this, that's kind of sometimes we something we discovered along the way too. Okay, any further questions uh, from the participants? I think we could have perhaps entertained one more. Uh, people can uh, unmute if they'd like to do so. If not, thank you very much, Luc. Thank well, you all thank for you. Um, staying with us. Bye, everyone. <laughs>